Hello, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all our speakers, chairs, and the one for audiences in different parts of the world. Welcome back to ACNS webinars. The speaker for the first session of today is our guest from the USA, Professor Giorgio Sinonos. Professor Sinonos is an assistant professor, co director of the Center for Cranial Body Surgery, as well as the director of the Cranial Lab Program and director of the Clinical Operations at the University of Pittsburgh. His clinical expertise is focused upon endoscopic and invasive surgery, minimally invasive neurosurgery, skull based tumors, skull -based based pathology, neuro-oncology, cerebrovascular, as well as cranial nerve disorders and radio surgery. He is a noted author and is an invited faculty to several workshops and conferences around the world and we are extremely honored to have him today at our webinars and today he will be talking about tools for successful skull based surgery in the modern era. The chair for the first session of today's webinar is our honored guest from Japan, Professor Sochioya. Professor Oya is a professor of neurosurgery at the Saitama Medical University, Saitama, Japan. He is an important member of the Japanese Neurosurgical Society and is an uh, important member of the ACNS as well. He has been a part of the ACNS delegation of workshops and conferences around the world. And uh, we are extremely honored to have him today at our webinars and also grateful to him for in accepting our invitation to chair the session of Professor Zinonos. On behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President of Yoko Kaito, I would like to welcome both the speakers, chairs and wonderful audiences to this online platform of ACNS webinars. Dr. Lubun Singh from Malaysia is my co-host for today and with an introduction, I would like to hand over this online podium to our first chair, Professor Soichi Oya. Um, we have uh, Professor George Zinanos uh, from uh, University of Pittsburgh Old Medical Center. Uh, as we all know that uh, the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center is uh, the one of the largest and the most famous uh, center in the field of uh, skull-based surgery. And uh, they have invented many, many new and innovative approaches to their uh, legion in the skull base and their uh, I would say they have uh, transformed the landscape of the skull base. And uh, uh, today uh, he's going to talk about uh, uh, tools uh, for success in modern skull base surgery. I guess tools in tools include uh, uh, instruments and uh, optical devices or techniques or strategies. So uh, I'm uh, very, very, uh, you know, the glad to uh, hear his lecture. So, uh, Professor Zanos, uh, can you kindly start your lecture for us? Yeah, absolutely. Um, first of all, uh, while I'm sharing this, um, Professor Oya, I'm so honored to be uh, part of this today. I think this has been uh, a phenomenal series, and um, one of the silver linings of having COVID is to have all this uh, series available online. Uh, I myself have learned tremendously, and I congratulate Dr. Kuri and Dr. Dr. Sang, um, and um, as well as Dr. Iwasaki, and um, of course Dr. Bin, Dr. Kato for organizing this. This has been really tremendous, and um, and something that should keep going on for uh, both senior and junior neurosurgeons alike. So thank you again. Um, can you see my screen? Okay. Yes. Okay. Excellent. So um, today's topic, um, we uh, we wanted to keep it a little bit broad uh, and give the perspective in terms of you know, some of the uh, advancements that happened in the field of skull-based surgery. Um, the skull-based surgery, as we know, um, deals a lot more with benign as opposed to malignant pathology, and a lot of the, the patients actually come in and have sometimes subtle symptoms um, so it's a pretty high risk, but also high return specialty. And for that reason, uh, it can also lead to a lot of fulfillment. Um, but um, it does need to, the, the skill needs to correlate uh, with the demand in order for it to be fulfilling. Um, so it's, it's good to equip ourselves with all the tools that we need uh, to make that happen uh, in a way that is safe, effective, um, and good for our patients. Um, in many in many ways, someone could uh, draw analogies to um, to a, a high risk sport, uh, where uh, again the demand uh, is great, but also um, it's it's very fulfilling. Um, this is a case of um, a pretty extensive anteroclinoidal meningioma. Uh, what I did here was a standard orbitozygomatic craniotomy. 
um, and that that's how, how uh, that's what, how he was uh, taught um, for us to do by many of the masters. Um, you know, do an extra dura anterocolinectomy and and trying to go down to the optic nerve uh, and open uh, uh, the optic canal, find the carotid artery proximally, and then sequentially go and um, essentially excavate everything out. Um, it's a very fulfilling surgery, but Again, that's that's how we did things, and for many years now, same goes with some of the lateral scar bases, the jugular glomus jugularis tumor. I'll spare the video. Um, two radio surgeries uh, that failed, so surgery for these lesions is still uh, very alive and needed. Um, but again, this this is is something that is, uh, has been taught to us uh, and has been done is virtually in a very similar way for several years now. Uh, but just like the, the base in a band uh, and skull base, what has been essential uh, was teamwork. And that's how we are able to advance the field forward. Um, that's something that uh, has been very well kept, at least at our institution. And uh, I personally have learned uh, as much from other services uh, that we have worked with as much as I've learned for, uh, from our neurosurgeons. Um, and uh, as we say in skull base surgery, alone will go faster, but to go, we go further. Um, again, in, at UPMC, uh, the, this has been very much um, the modus over Andy, uh, trying to work together side by side, try to put our minds together um, to do, try and do um, better things and, and things think out of the box, do things um, in a different way, perhaps uh, sharing our experiences. Um, we're lucky to have like a very extensive team that makes the Center for Cranial Brain Surgery today made up by, by many uh, uh, specialists. Um, and uh, a lot of the endonasal procedures that we do today is an example of a pretty sizable chordoma. It's, it's analogous to working side by side um, in an airplane uh, where, you know, co-pilots work together to uh, go from point A to point B, uh, keeping two um, sets of minds, uh, four eyes and four hands in the field uh, to try and make the surgery as, as effective and as safe as possible. Uh, dynamic endoscopy here, again, allows us to do things that perhaps we wouldn't be able to uh, otherwise, and uh, again, keeps things safer. But, you know, progress hasn't been straightforward uh, and, and never is. And it's a combination of know-how and technological advancements. Um, the fathers of microneurosurgery, Dr. Yasergil Donahy, Dr. Rotem, um, that uh, essentially uh, created the field uh, of microneurosurgery have been the fathers of it. But one of the revolutions that happened, at least in, in skull-based surgery, um, is the evolution of uh, endoscopy and donasal approaches that opened a whole different corridor um, in the ventral skull base that is medial to the cranial nerves uh, and medial to a lot of the important vasculature and also opened uh, some versatility uh, to uh, skull base approaches that can extend essentially from the Crista Galli down to C2. Um, this again didn't st start you know, immediately like that, uh, all the way back in the early 1900s with Schoffler and going to Cushing, Oscar Hirsch, uh, Jules Hardy, um, uh, Buzzini inventing the endoscope and um, with many, many pioneers uh, culminating in uh, Heidong Joe and Ricardo Corral that are credited with doing the, um, the first endoscopic endonasal pituitary surgeries um, at our institution. And over the years, there have been many, many advances um, that have eventually have uh, created this toolbox uh, where it allows us to, with performing different modules, um, getting to uh, most of the places that we need to get to in the ventral skull base. So this is a, a case that I had done last year that perhaps we wouldn't be able to do without the know-how uh, uh, perhaps a decade ago, it's a pretty extensive epidermoid that goes um, and fills the basal cisterns, extends all the way up to 
the third ventricle um, uh, pretty high and also in, in the posterior fossa and the CP angle. Um, and it, it kind of illustrates a lot of the modern uh, techniques that we use uh, in endoscopic skull based surgery. Um, here we're opening the cavernous sinus on, on each side and um, uh, my goal here is to remove the posterior clinoids to essentially combine um, the posterior fossa to um, the um, middle cranial fossa um, in order to essentially perform a combined approach. Um, this is a transcavernous approach that was uh, described by Dr. Juan Fernandez Miranda when he was here and opening in the posterior fossa, now opening supracellularly. Uh, you can see the uh, supraphysial arteries here. I'm gonna speed this up a little bit, uh, but eventually uh, combining the two corridors in the posterior fossa um, and in the supracellular space uh, and making our way posteriorly through the membrane liliquist uh, to the tumor. These tumors are, you know, of course, very easy in the beginning. Uh, they're very uh, aspiratable and, and they're not bloody. Uh, but when you get to the capsule of the tumor, uh, they, they can become much more challenging uh, because exactly they infiltrate some of the arachnoidal uh, planes. Um, and you can see here the involvement of microvasculature. Dr. Eric Wong here is working through a very narrow corridor um, to uh, uh, gain a visualization. These are very few millimeters that you know, are available, but again, with um, specialized teams uh, and people that are invested um, we can get the visualization we need to do real microsurgery, um, dissect the microvasculature, and um, be effective in removing uh, the pathology that we're tackling with. Um, these are the CP angle here, this cranial nerve four, three, and five, um, and working methodically, I'm gonna speed this up here, multi-layer reconstruction. Um, in order to do this, um, surgeries. Um, we do need specialized equipment, and this is something that has been developed over the years. Um, here's a one example. There's a, what we call the Pittsburgh set. Um, this is a set of micro dissectors as well as bipolars um, that allows us to do uh, a lot of the micro dissection techniques that are known in open skull based surgery. Um, neurophysiology monitoring has been instrumental. Um, this is an example here of a pretty extensive. Um, pituitary tumor that's invading all compartments in both cavernous sinuses. And many times it's, it's extremely hard to identify the current nerves in a normal fashion. So having neurophysiology support as an early um, signal of, that you're approaching a cranial nerve and you have to be careful uh, is extremely important. Understanding the anatomy from a different perspective has also been instrumental. Um, and then gain that different perspective from the, the anatomy that we know from a transcranial to an endonasal perspective, understanding you know, the minutia of um, some of the microvasculature, for example. And this has been very important, um, let's say in craniopharyngiomas. Uh, There's an example of a, a, a craniopharyngioma that presented with vision loss. Um, and because exactly we're able to understand the microvasculature, what, um, what branches of the inferior epiphyseal of the superior epiphyseal artery can be put, potentially expanded, um, ex, are, are potentially expandable uh, with preservation of function. We were able to remove this tumor uh, with preserving uh, function. Um, you see some of the branch of the superior epiphyseal, the inferior branch going to the um, uh, diaphragma here uh, was sacrificed and that allowed us to have the corridor to uh, gain access into the tumor. Um, the branches to the stalk and uh, to um, the chiasm are of course not expendable, uh, but in being able to uh, understand which are expendable, we're actually creating enough of a corridor uh, so that we are not necessarily putting those at risk as much uh, as we could have if we didn't uh, understand the microvascular. And this is a preserved stock uh, on the left side. And the patient did require steroids for about four months, but um, uh, that, that's one that we're lucky enough to be able to preserve function. Uh, more extensive tumors, such as um, 
olfactory groove, meaning geomas. Um, you know, this is uh, working up the curve. Is a precalcified tumor here. Uh, and working methodically, the same applies in starting the, um, the microvasculature as well as the macrovasculature from this perspective and uh, developing the techniques to dissect them. What has been uh, uh, pretty revolutionary is, is the understanding of the dural layers around the central skull base and around the pituitary gland. Um, uh, particularly lately uh, with the uh, pituitary ligaments, uh, as well as the detailed anatomy of the medial cavernous wall. Um, we know that this has been uh, a reason or invasion of this medial cavernous wall has, has been a reason for uh, recurrences, but also um, uh, the, uh, uh, the reason for um, uh, the absence of endocrinoloid remission in many of the functional tumors. So um, it, uh, it has been really revolutionary. Um, as we know, again, that's a, um, these are slides that were shared by Dr. Fernandez Miranda, who's one of my uh, dear friends and, and teachers, um, that he described this technique of removing the medial cavernous wall um, and um, removing that uh, small residual tumor that, again, uh, can keep Cushing's patients or acromegalic patients from complete remission. Um, it is very effective and uh, recent data uh, supports that even more. Uh, but is it safe? Um, the answer is uh, yes, that um, in, uh, when done appropriately uh, uh, and from our series in the University of Pittsburgh, it did appear to be uh, quite safe. Um, but um, this is a, a case that it's a little bit further than the average. This is uh, an acromegalic patient um, that did appear to potentially have some invasion of the cavernous size wall, but also has uh, an aneurysm uh, right in the, in the tumor. So what do you do in, in this situation? Is this still safe to perform uh, when uh, there is an aneurysm in the, um, essentially embedded in the corticoclinoidal ligament? Um, and we discussed about the options, but ultimately we felt that uh, potentially uh, we could tackle both. Um, it's a pretty extensive exposure. Here I'm opening uh, the cella and then I'm packing the cavernous sinus. I'm opening the cavernous sinus uh, and trying to identify current nerve six, uh, just lateral to the choroid artery. Here is six here. Uh, and my goal here is to obtain proximal control, just like we do in vascular neurosurgery. Uh, this is a landing zone, the paracella choroid artery for proximal control. Identifying the normal gland on the left side and after some debulking, um, opening supracellularly, I did want to see at least a glimpse of um, the um, super um, clinoidal choroid artery for uh, distal control. And after remove some of the tumor, this is a standard procedure. This is where the aneurysm would be, uh, dividing the diaphragma uh, and removing some of the um, <clears throat> inner membranes. But we know that we're not done there. Uh, this medial cavernous wall is usually invaded, uh, so we have, do have to peel it off the choroid artery. Uh, we're going all the way back to dorsum cella here, and we're performing an ICG run to see exactly where the beginning of the aneurysm is. Um, the, again, the aneurysm is essentially um, pushing the corticoclinoid ligament inferiorly, so cutting this uh, is a more challenging than, um, than it would be in a regular case. Uh, but eventually separating the aneurysm and clipping the aneurysm as well after the medial wall is removed. We're careful here to preserve, again, the microvascular. These are the superhypophysial arteries. This is superhypophysial aneurysm um, that are nicely preserved. Multilayer reconstruction is important for this um, cases. And the, the patient did um, well. He was in remission. Even going through the oculomotor triangle, um, sometimes it's, um, it's possible by opening the corridor, understanding the anatomy um, of the cavern, of the roof, of the posterior roof of the cavernous sinus. Um, so the cavernous sinus involvement has become much less of a limitation, particularly with the advent of you know, good neurophysiology, understanding the anatomy. Um, so uh, many, many tumors that uh, were, were perhaps a decade ago were considered unresectable 
uh, we can do a good job with. <clears throat> um, we showed an example of a pituitary transposition uh, that has also been instrumental in tackling pathologies uh, that are essentially in the interpeduncular space. Uh, this is a case uh, uh, that um, I did uh, relatively early, um, but there's a cavernous malformation uh, of the midbrain that is essentially was had multiple bleeds and was causing a third nerve palsy. Uh, you can see it with tractography here, uh, the cranial nerve three was pushed down. Um, but again, the same technique of uh, performing this transcavernous approach, coagulating, dividing the inferior hypophyseal arteries and exposing posterior clinoids, um, dividing the corticoclinoidal ligaments and um, removing the posterior clinoids uh, in two pieces, then opening the supracellular space, uh, making sure we preserve the superficial arteries and combining um, the supracellular space with the posterior fossa. I'm gonna speed this up a little bit, dividing the membrane of Lilliquist here. And then this, um, this mass is coming in between, here's um, the uh, P2 segment, Here's the PCOM plugging in and the SCA. Here's the third nerve. Uh, and you see the hemorrhagic mass that's coming to a surface. <clears throat> the corticospinal tracts were pushed posteriorly. Um, we're making sure again that this is not an aneurysm. Uh, and this provide, really provided an ideal approach because we didn't have to work above the P2 segment with the uh, perforators. So I'm working under um, the P2 segment and uh, looking up. Uh, which is very hard to do when you're coming from an orbital zygomatic approach uh, so you, uh, that forces you to look down more than up. And this um, wor worked out well, again, multilayered reconstruction. Um, in, a, in the posterior fossa, in an analogous way that we have the far lateral approaches, we're in, in tongue in cheek, uh, um, call them the far medial approaches. Um, uh, to uh, the posterior um, skull base, um, understanding the anatomy of the jugular tubercle uh, and how to mobilize the uh, eustachian tube um, to perform um, the quote unquote extreme medial approaches. Um, resection of the mandibular strut and the lingual process allows further mobilization laterally. Um, and uh, more recently, something that was uh, popularized by Dr. Um, uh, Dr. Carl Snyderman is the contralateral transmaxillary approach, where we come from the contralateral maxillary corridor. This is an example of a chondrosarcoma. Uh, and these are uh, cases that um, this has been very useful for uh, working in the petrous apex um, all the way uh, almost to essentially the cochlea. Um, it allows really um, the corridor that we need to get there. Um, for our magnum meningiomas um, are also tackled nicely because they lay under the sixth nerve. Uh, sixth nerve is above us. So uh, that is the main concern with posterior um, fossa meningiomas. Um, that's, that's been a dagger in terms of uh, being able to tackle them appropriately. Uh, but it does provide like an optimum exposure because we devascularize the tumor early. Uh, he, this one in particular was essentially encircling um, the anterospinal artery. So you see the anterospinal artery essentially within the tumor. Um, perhaps sometimes it's a more blind procedure and you're relying on good planes uh, to uh, dissect that when you're coming from laterally, although that is a far lateral approach is it's very much alive and something I, I um, often do for this tumor is this was, I thought, um, more appropriate for endonasal given the very ventral and bilateral extension here. Um, <clears throat> reconstruction is um, extraordinarily important uh, in skull-based surgery in general, but endoscopy and nasal surgery in particular. Um, we've been shown some uh, cases that went uh, well so far, but um, it's good to um, be able to deal with the disasters. This was an unfortunate 20-year-old um, young woman who uh, came to us with a metastatic alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma. She had received over 110 gray of radiation, uh, but then had recurrences uh, just in the skull base that had been stable for a while, and then she presented with a six-nerve palsy. Um, this was 
uh, sort of a questionable case in terms of, uh, you know, offering surgery versus not by given her age um, and the stability of this uh, lesion over time, we chose to go ahead. Um, and I'm not going to go to the detailed surgery. We did a call to a lock on the right side, going uh, through the uh, PPF on the right side and into the infratemporal fossa uh, and extending into the clivus, uh, both um, uh, condyles, uh, particularly the left condyle was the most involved here. You see again that um, relationship of the uh, hypoglossal canal uh, with uh, the, medi the medial jugular tubercle and the occipital condyle. Here is that relationship here. Um, we actually didn't get a spinal fluid leak in this case. And uh, we're able to peel all of the tumor of the carotid and uh, preserve the periosteal layer. Um, <clears throat> but then uh, she, she did actually well and she was discharged, but then she had a debridement in another state. And then uh, nearly four months later, she presented with a leak. Um, the first thing we tried to do was um, to fix it primarily. That didn't work. Um, we tried to do um, a temporal parietal fascia flap. Well, this is well described uh, where you uh, harvest the temporal parietal fascia and then you tunnel it through the maxillary sinus into the skull base. Um, so we tried that. Um, that didn't take. So we had to go back. Um, and then um, this is not the actual video from that, but uh, we had to use essentially a, an extra cranial pericranial flap. That is something that we use often when uh, there's no uh, available um, there's a septal flap uh, and malignancies, et cetera. And that, and that actually did the trick along with a shunt. Uh, she stayed in the hospital for uh, almost a month, uh, but that's how we were able to repair. The next step obviously would have been a free flap. Um, I've been fortunate to have um, input, you know, from the University of Pittsburgh with uh, with uh, my mentors here, um, also in the University of Miami with, with Dr. Morquist, Dr. Harris, and also Dr. Lunsford. And ultimately, you know, you put everything in a blender and you kind of develop your own preferences and, and biases. And, and many times, you know, there is no, you know, one perfect approach. Sometimes you have to combine things together. Um, and choose the appropriate thing uh, for the appropriate pathology. This is an example of a patient that had a pretty extensive central skull base, I mean, in geoma, uh, that with the bulk of it being extending into um, the sphenoid sinus, she had very profound vision loss, almost light perception on the left eye, kind of a circumferential uh, compression of the nerve. But that's a case that I thought that if we went laterally first and do a targeted clinectomy, that would afford early decompression of the optic nerve, as opposed to go through the blood loss of endonasal surgery without landmarks uh, and trying to identify that. There's an extra dural anterocliniectomy through a relatively limited lateral approach, the periorbia, the optic nerve uh, here, and creating a trough so we can create a landmark essentially for us to find. We're going to nasal, is a super artificial, the optic stroke, corioculum, or membrane. Um, and then um, at the same time, then once the nerve is decompressed, uh, at least in a bony fashion, going into nasally to remove the rest of the tumor. Um, here is actually the optic strut um, or the lateral OCR that's completely removed. So is the optic nerve and we're removing the optic strut from medially as well. So this, the nerve is essentially 360 decompressed, at least in a bony fashion now. And once the bony work is done, uh, this is where um, central scalp based meningiomas usually invade the optic canal. Uh, this is the inferior medial optic canal um, that's always invaded. And I believe um, endoscopic approach provides a superior view because you don't have to manipulate the optic nerve to get under uh, the inferior medial optic canal, trying to manipulate the nerves as little as possible and dividing the diaphragma, having a good view of the um, microvasculature and the superficial arteries here, um, the medial choroid artery and dividing, again, the distal dual ring. Um, and then we, we did as, as comprehensive a job as we could here. Obviously, there's not a Simpson gray one resection 
um, but uh, as good as we could. Because exactly, I believe, we didn't manipulate the optic nerve. Um, we didn't have to move it around. Uh, this is the bony result, like a 360 compression. Um, we got lucky, and then she did uh, improve dramatically um, from hand motion to actually 2030. Um, but I, I do feel that there's a, a tremendous um, value in not manipulating the optic nerve, uh, specifically try to devise a strategy where you uh, decompress the nerve with the least amount of blood loss, with the least amount of fluid shifts, you know, avoid too much mannitol, let's say, um, from, uh, from an anterior approach, etc. cetera. Uh, Dr. Morcos was also, um, again, one of my mentors, was a big proponent that vascular and skull-based surgery are inseparable, uh, that they're inseparable twins, um, and that uh, they're complementary in a way that uh, the result is more than a sum of its parts. Um, there are many instances where this uh, comes in handy. Obviously, we learn a lot of the vascular surgery by doing vascular surgery. There's uh, an example of a pre-atherosclerotic um, MC aneurysm with an M2 branch coming off the aneurysm. Um, here, uh, we harvested, I harvested the STA um, and tried to clip it primarily, um, but this proved to be impossible without stenosing that branch. Um, Serendipitously, like there are two M, the the two other uh, M two branches were coming very close together, um, so it I did a, like an M two to M two bypass here to revascularize that and protect that other branch. I'm not going to belabor this, um, but that's something that we relatively routinely do in in um, open vascular Hello. surgery, and this um, this skills uh, come in handy when. Uh, we need them in, in skull-based surgery as well. This is the ICG run. Uh, one example is when we have to sacrifice a choroid artery. Uh, this is an example of uh, uh, an anaplastic, multiply recurring anaplastic meningioma. I was invading the cavernous sinus, um, completely ophthalmoplegic, and uh, failed the balloon test occlusion. Um, so... Um, is a patient that um, would do high flow bypass um, from the ECA to um, NM2 and then counter science exoneration. And of course, sometimes you can't predict that you need it. Um, is an example of a Sylvian meningioma. This was extra, extraordinarily uh, fibrous. Uh, I couldn't internally bulk this tumor, so I essentially had to cut it out, um, dissecting it from um, all the sylvian vessels. Uh, but you know, at some point during the procedure, I got a little bit disoriented. And here I was trying to, I thought was, I was within the tumor itself. Um, I didn't realize there was a branch that was coming out towards uh, within the tumor and being enveloped within the tumor. That was an opercular branch that was going towards Broca's. So um, essentially cut into that. Um, once I realized that, uh, that this was the branch that was going towards Broca's, I realized that that's no, not an expendable branch trying to get control of the situation here and remove some more tumor to um, see if I can repair it. I did try to see if I can repair it in a primary fashion. Um, it did initially seem to Doppler, but this didn't work. Uh, I did an ICG run here and then this had uh, either clawed off or uh, it just wasn't uh, enough of a, enough of an opening. Um, so essentially, um, uh, open it up, did an end-to-end -end anastomos here. Um, this is challenging because you don't really have the capacity to, uh, turn the vessel around. So the posterior wall is essentially an inside out technique here. Um, but, um, we're able to save this vessel. Um, fortunately, fortunately she was, um, she did have some word finding difficulty, but this was transient and we 
we served her a stroke from um, in her Broca's area that would have been pretty detrimental. Sometimes, you know, it's about otherwise around uh, where in um, vascular neurosurgery, you uh, may need to employ some skull based techniques. Um, there's a, a case of like bilateral MCA aneurysms, uh, which is well, very well described. Uh, but uh, in trying to deal with the contralateral MCA aneurysm, I mean, initially I thought it was going to be a very short uh, segment, but in getting there, it was very clear that um, the anterior clinoid was covering the aneurysm. So you see the anterior clinoid on the contralateral side here, it's, it's covered. Um, so essentially, uh, I had done something here that I had never done before, but uh, we, had that, we had to do like a contralateral anterior clinoidectomy that gave us a little bit better uh, control of the uh, of the aneurysm and then uh, turning back and, and clipping the ips lateral one, reconstructing it. Uh, so we're able to tackle both. I apologize. How much time do we, we have still? Well, I think it's the 10. Ten Maybe minutes. Five or ten minutes. Ten minutes. Okay. Perfect. Yep. All right. All right. Transorbital approaches have been extremely powerful and it's largely uh, uh, have been a powerhouse uh, in terms of approaching many of the middle and skull based pathologies, either with an eyebrow incision, uh, with or without this extension uh, downwards, a lateral canthus incision, where we use the opening of the eye along with this um, uh, one or two centimeter incision in the lateral canthus. Um, and then many times an, an eyelid incision that can be combined with that. Um, these are, they, they do lead into fantastic um, uh, cosmetic outcomes. Uh, these are an example, these are some examples of it. Uh, this is an example of even intraaxial tumors like or for an epidermoid or a sphenoorbital meningioma. Uh, this is an example of a pretty extensive tumor uh, with um, significant edema where we did this uh, eyelid incision uh, particularly in older people, uh, this can be hidden in creases very well, and it does lead to a pretty good result uh, cosmetically. Um, and these approaches actually provide like a very a fantastic corridor with um, with a lot of room to be able to to uh, do exactly what we would do if if we did like a traditional orbital zygomatic approach, uh, peeling um, a lot of all the cavernous there, and then um, the uh, puzzle result. And again, sometimes I, I argue with our fellows, to, um, I, I challenge them to find like where uh, the incision was. We do the surgeries with our plastic surgeons. Um, so the cosmetic result tends to be quite good, but I can't take credit for it. Um, I do have a special interest in uh, cranial nerve disorders. Um, it, this was a, a previously an MVD, but endoscopic procedures, particularly for a section of the nerve intermedius, can be quite um, advantageous. Um, seeing the nervous intermediates can be challenging uh, from a lateral approach pre uh, precisely because it's sort of under um, and in between seven and eight um, sling procedures, uh, uh, and a procedure that uh, requires a little bit of a skull base toolbox in order to perform for large dolgoctatic vertebral arteries for hemifacial spasm. Uh, this technique that uh, this is a technique that I learned from Dr. Morcos and works quite well with a very large uh, arteries that are pushing on the nerve. Um, of course, large acoustic neuromas and um, uh, sphenoorbital, I mean, geomas, medial sphenio wing, uh, or um, trigeminal schwannomas um, with Kawasi approaches. That are all, they can all lead to facial pain syndromes. Uh, that can be treated uh, well with a, a skull-based toolbox. In the last uh, very few minutes, um, I wanted to um, sort of round up the discussion um, in that, uh, you know, in, in order to succeed and push our um, field forward, it's, it's necessary to um, invest also a, a both in teaching, but also clinical but, and basic and translational research. Um, in understanding our enemy, understanding the pathology that we are treating becomes instrumental. One, one of the things that I personally had worked uh, quite a bit on was 
trying to figure out how to classify chordoma, skull-based chordoma. That, that's something that uh, was very poorly uh, defined uh, with a lot of the skull-based chordomas being in the uh, conventional category, but having like a very wide uh, degree of um, variation in terms of their prognosis. Um, and I'm not going to go into details because of time, but uh, over time, we're able to create like a prognostication module based on uh, two deletions, one P36 uh, and nine P21, which is P16, uh, and try and categorize uh, the tumors based on um, the degree of deletions that they had uh, based on, on fish, um, and then uh, try to devise um, uh, guidelines in terms of how to treat them and when to use adjuvant or radiotherapy. Uh, it turns out that um, the only uh, patient that we currently do adjuvant radiotherapy for is um, patients that are in the most uh, aggressive category, group C, or um, only in, in, uh, group, in group B tumors that had incomplete resection to start with where this was not possible. But for patients that do have complete resections, both in group A, which is the most benign group, and group B, um, we uh, tend to observe them without radiation therapy. Um, hopefully, we'll be doing this in a multi-institutional fashion. Um, radiomics is, is another um, point that we've worked with with these tumors and radiogenomics, uh, tying to tie both clinical outcomes as well as some of the genetics. Um, and um, comparing some of the recurrent tumors, um, uh, genetics with uh, the primary tumors, uh, trying to hone in some of the specific um, genetic alterations that are um, uh, particular to that uh, transition from um, a more benign tumor to more aggressive tumor. Um, circulating DNA, it's going to be in the future um, of monitoring these tumors and evaluate degree of resection, understanding um, visual outcomes. Um, augmented reality is something that um, is also going to be in the workflow. Uh, essentially revolutionizing the, uh, our uh, OR footprint, uh, being able to put uh, the screens where we want them, uh, switch between 2D and 3D uh, where we need to, uh, and having all the information in front of us, uh, advanced micro um, uh, visualization techniques uh, to understand tumor from non-tumor. There's an example of the stores, um, contact endoscopy, um, uh, endoscopes, um, understanding our the results of um, in neurocognitive outcomes, uh, and I'm going to try and be respectful of everyone's time. Uh, also in the lab uh, with anatomical studies, um, and um, it's important to keep on our uh, teaching courses. Uh, hope, thankfully, now we're back uh, doing all those live again. So. In conclusion, our toolbox is um, it varies widely, and, and we have to focus both on um, uh, in the OR and uh, from the lab to the OR, but also um, in in our research efforts to try and answer the several questions that are born every day and um, and tackle the difficulties that we are faced with every day. So, uh, I'm going to stop here. Um, and I, I want to thank you again so much for, for the opportunity. It's wonderful to be here with everyone. It's a great honor. Um, if, I don't know if there are any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Zinonos. Uh, we are uh, amazed at your talk. Your talk, you know, um, ranges a wide variety of topics, you know, from our very highly complicated surgical cases to or some advanced basic researchers. And uh, uh, let's go to the question from the audience first. Um, uh, from This is a question from Dr. Perks. Uh, how, you, uh, how do you decide whether to use radial artery or venous uh, graft interfordition for uh, bypass? Uh, that's a great. That's a great question. I think um, uh, Venus is definitely uh, much more um, versatile in terms of the length. Um, it it it's something that uh, will prove you uh, correct in many times. I do 
evaluate the carotid artery, the, I'm sorry, the, um, the radial arteries with um, uh, reader, uh, uh, um, ultrasonographic Allen's tests to make sure that they're nicely paid in, they didn't have an injury. Um, many times, um, just studying the anatomy, uh, if you're going to have enough length. If there's a very small person, many times, you know, their, their arms are just not long enough. Uh, so you may have to go to a venous graft, but um, I, I do like the radial arteries better than the venous um, grafts, uh, just because it's it's an artery and theoretically has like a better longevity. That's, uh, you know, uh, uh, a, mat uh, a matter of debate, but um, in general, where we can get away with a radial graft, I think it's, it's, it's not common that we do that for tumors, obviously, but. Okay, thanks. And there, uh, this is a question from myself. Uh, I guess that uh, lateral extension may be uh, one of the reasons for you to hesitate uh, to perform transnasal endoscopic surgery, but is there anything uh, in the nature of the tumor itself that would make you think that you should avoid endoscopic surgery? Yeah. So for, for example, what if the tumor is very prone to bleeding or or if it's very hard, firm, or if it's predicted by the preoperative examination, do you sometimes avoid? You mean if it's like a if it looks like it's a hard tumor based on T2 right. and, and the WI? That's mm -hmm. an excellent question. I think to I guess I will answer in two parts. To the the first part of it, I think it's always um, a good strategy to try and tackle a tumor from where it came from whether you're trying to, uh, um, to tackle it from a lateral uh, skull-based approach or an intranasal skull-based approach, uh, because if you tackle the, patient, the tumor where, from where it came from, that tumor is naturally going to expand all the arachnoidal planes and all the neurovascular structures from where it came from. So if you follow it from where it started, um, I think you're always in an advantageous uh, position. Um, so there, sometimes there are tumors, like it's very... Uh, for example, if you have like a medial extension of a clinoidal meningioma, if you have a recurrence of a clinoidal meningioma that's supracellar, that tumor may be very dangerous to tackle endonasally. Mm -hmm. And that's because the microvasculature is all going to be pushed medially, okay. right? So as opposed to like a tumor that may have extended laterally, but it started medially. Now, of course, there's, there's limitations how lateral you can go. Um, and, you know, that's, that's been part of, you know, trying to push the boundaries of how lateral you can go. Uh, but uh, trying to tackle it from where it came from. And that also will give you an advantage from devas for devascularizing the tumor. So if you, if you tackle the base of the tumor first, then once you go into the tumor, usually it's less vascular than uh, once you tackle it from the other side of it. Now, in terms of um, the consistency, um, I, I think sometimes it's hard to um, predict uh, accurately. And then there are tumors that are, um, we think they're going to be fibers and they're actually not that fibers and vice versa. I think the vice versa is more dangerous many times where you think it's going to be soft and it's not. Um, so I, I, I feel that I, I'm not good enough in predicting that accurately to uh, make that decide, you know, what approach we're going to take. Mm -hmm. Uh, and in a way, um, we do have many of the same tools. So uh, we have like an ultrasonic aspirator. We have the micro debrider. We have like uh, many tools that can help you work through a fibrous tumor. Uh, but there's no question that many times a, a very fibrous tumor that's stuck to everything can make for a very difficult day. No question about it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Dr. Lu, Lu yes, can we have yeah, your thanks. comments from you? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Professor, for a wonderful uh, uh, presentation. Uh, I have three main three questions, Professor. Uh, first, first, if you have shown us, uh, I think the first time I'm seeing a clipping of aneurysm uh, from the endoscopic skull base, um, I know uh, in your experience, what are the uh, most common indications uh, for such a procedure? Uh, my second question, Professor, in, is there any instances that uh, uh, a skull-based bony reconstruction are needed uh, in what, what instances that uh, uh, bony reconstruction are needed. My last question, Professor, in which of the skull-based uh, procedure you would not put a lumbar drain? Thank you, process, Professor. 
all, all fantastic questions. Again, thank you again for uh, um, for invitation and, and being here. So, to, uh, in terms of the um, the aneurysms, it's pretty rare. Uh, this was a this was a case that would have been treated with a flow diverter, right? Um, that we showed now. Um, some of the other patients that I treated was um, was, for example, a medially pointing of thalamic aneurysm. Uh, in a patient that had uh, menorrhages. So they couldn't put her on aspirin and plavix. It was expanding aneurysm. Uh, so we treated it nasally. Um, sometimes very medial uh, pica aneurysms. So if you have a pica and, and then somehow the anatomy is such that um, the dominant uh, vert is such that it's pushed so much away from it so that it's, it's so far in medial. Um, that's, um, that's another instance where a transclival approach, you know, would give you a good, um, visualization of that. Pycanderisms, when they're more distal, they're, ex it's extremely hard to visualize the distal artery. Um, but it's, it's not common. It's not common. Um, I think we we're actually putting it, uh, our institutional experience together for all the aneurysms, um, to publish, but, um, it's just a handful over the course of several, several years. Um, your second question was, um, is there a role for bodily reconstruction? Or yes. reconstruction? We tend to avoid it. Um, and, you know, much of the reason is that um, if you put it in a way uh, that is firm, it tends to be against the choroid arteries. And we've seen cases that, uh, we did as a redo case where those had eroded into the choroid arteries. And so we're removing it. If you ever have to go back, that creates like an essential and impossible situation. Um, we tend to not to use it. I know there are many um, centers that are advocates for it, uh, but we tend not to use that for that particular reason. So if you do have to go back, um, sometimes it, it can be jammed around the choroid arteries in a way that it becomes dangerous. And um, for your third question, I'm sorry, uh, please remind me. Uh, uh, lumbar drain, which case you the want lumbar to drain, The lumbar drain, yeah. So for large, so we actually had like, um, one of the uh, prior fellows here had done a, uh, had led um, a randomized control trial. Uh, and that was stopped early because all posterior fossa defects, if we had, um, and that's all for patients that have, um, that have a CSF ligand intraoperatively. But posterior fossa defects, generally we would use a lumbar drain if there's a high flow leak. Um, if there's a, a craniofacial resections with more than two centimeters of a defect, we would usually use a, a lumbar drain. For supracellar, smaller supracellar defects, let's say for craniopharyngiomas, even those sometimes that extend to the ventricle. Uh, if it's a... Um, Tuberculum salaminigioma that is hasn't undergone like a very extensive dural resection. That's a little bit more limited, like that's less than two centimeters. Um, almost never for pituitary adenomas. All those cases um, we will would, we would not use lumbar drains. So um, cellar and small supercellar defects, we almost never use lumbar drains. Now, there are times where patients are morbidly obese. Um, we're worried about, you know, our reconstruction. We routinely use um, ICG angiography uh, for the flaps to make sure they're vascularized. So uh, if for some reason there's concern about the flap and its viability, uh, there's, let's say, like if there's a large tear in the flap, um, we would also use uh, additional, you know, fascia and um, even for, you know, more simple defects. Um, so if you have a combination of a large obese patient and, and, and reconstruction that you're worried about, um, sometimes, you know, that's the uh, situation where we potentially use a lumbar drain. Um, but generally, not for cellar supercellar defects that are small. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you. Uh, Kasanov? Dr. Kasanov, do you have any questions or comments? You're muted. Please hey, unmute. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Hi. Uh, 
Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, Professor, for excellent presentation. Uh, it was very informative for me as a learner. So uh, I wanted to ask about some question, but I got already got some response. But uh, my interest is to your approach about how to do you select uh, approach regarding um, ACOM and reasons. ACOM. Yes. So um, I've I've. I haven't treated personally an ACOM, you know, through an intranasal approach. Uh, are there, uh, you mean like try to go lateral through in, or, or interhemispheric? Yes. Yeah, it's a good question. So um, in general, I try to go from this, especially if it's a rupture aneurysm, from the side of the dominant A1 to have like better proximal control. So in generally, that would, um, that would amount to the, the dome of the aneurysm pointing away from you. So I, I would never want to come, you know, at an ACOM where, you know, the dome is pointing towards the side I'm coming from. I know many, many people advocate for coming from the right regardless because it's not the non-dominant hemisphere. Uh, but um, in general, I never do interhemispherics, uh, almost always lateral. Uh, many times for, uh, we would do even like a, an eyebrow uh, incision uh, and take the rim, but like a, a mini superlateral orbitotomy, uh, that would give you like enough of exposure. Um, or like uh, do like a, a regular lateral approach or, or a full OZ. Uh, but decidedness mainly for where the A1 is dominant, I would say that sums it up pretty much. Thank you. Good. Thank, Thank you, you. Uh, Raja. Well, uh, I can only say that. Uh, I'm amazed and surprised with such wonderful techniques and demonstrations of various uh, approaches, the far medial, the transmetal, the transorbital, and it's an immensely, I must say, mind-boggling approaches that you have shown. There is so much to learn from you and hopefully someday you can uh, be with us for the ACNS in person for some workshops and can teach us uh, in future. So thank you very much. And uh, I must uh, give it back to our Honorable Chair, Professor Suchuya, to hear his concluding remarks. Okay. Uh, today, uh, we had a uh, lecture from uh, Dr. Dinanos, and uh, it was uh, like, uh, you know, uh, Roger said that it was fantastic. And, uh, uh, you know, um, and very creative. I think uh, the people are working for uh, the UPMC are creating um new path to the uh formidable you know their diseases so uh, i was so surprised and amazed and uh, uh that was a, a great lecture thank you very much thank you again i'm deeply honored to be with everyone today um i know ev everyone is a uh, um is a and an expert in the fields here and um e everyone advancing um, in their own way, you know, uh, our field. So thank you for doing that and thank you for having me today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Liu. Would you do the honors? Yes, I think uh, we may uh, close the session for today. On uh, behalf of the Education Committee and the SNS President, Professor Yokato, uh, I would like to thank both uh, speaker uh, and as well as the chair, Professor uh, George uh, Zenonos and also our chair, Professor Sochi Oya for the time and support for the SNS webinars. I would like also thanks, uh, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to Professor Zubin, who broadcast this webinar on a WeChat channel. And uh, we we able to telecast this uh, via three different platforms. And uh, also a special thanks again uh, to, to Dr. Uh, Prof, uh, Professor Raja uh, for, for keeping uh, us uh, for this uh, webinars. And uh, until we meet again on 4th of February, uh, is, is bye bye from all of us, and uh, thank you very much for joining.